Greeting fellow citizens of Frontierland. It's that time again. It's time to do the summer 2021 designer walkthrough tour of Frontierland. The last time we did this in the spring, we saw half of Frontierland close. Let's walk through and see how this land has developed three months after we did this the first time. One of the many benefits of the hub and spoke design that Walt Disney used for Disneyland, which is in nearly every single one of the Disney theme parks, is that it creates this extra space away from the hub. This creek through here and the extra wide bridge, what this provides is an amazing sound and visual barrier, therefore transforming you from turn of a century America to the frontier of America with this example of Frontierland. One of my favorite ways to enter and view Frontierland is right here on a path that I refer to as the outer hub where you can kind of come in quietly and avoid everybody going across the wider, more accessible bridge. The hub and spoke design concept was originated from Italy and was used in early European design all across Europe. This is also true of the log cabin, the design that was used for the Western Ho Trading Company which is now open, but wasn't the case when we did our spring designer walkthrough tour. Log cabins go back to 1640 in the US. Frontierland is themed to the American frontier of the 19th century, which runs from about 1607 to 1912. Frontierland is focusing on the second half of that huge amount of years. As the frontier moved westward, the establishment of the US military forts moved along with it, Fort Wilderness has the look of a 1870s fort and using the perishable supplies of that time to tell the 1800s story. The flags of the Revolutionary War are the flags you see on the top of the two walls flanking when you come in. There are 13 of them, symbolize the original 13 colonies of America. All of the props that you see illustrate a life that existed in the Wild West nearly 80 years before Disneyland would be built symbolizing the lifestyle of the settler, a very different lifestyle than today's citizens of Disneyland. Here we can see a blooming tree that today looks more like a part of Adventureland, but months ago looked more like a citizen of Frontierland, a tree that could only be planted on the seams between these two lands. Here on the edge of Frontierland, we see the Pioneer Merchantile constructed of Ponderosa pine logs. And in the opening berth, of the thoroughfare of Frontierland, we see Walt Disney's opening day speech. And this is what it looked like three months ago. A lot less folks inside of Frontierland. The last time we explored Frontierland, this side of the street, shops were open, but everything on this side was closed. Back in May, there was a lot of Disneyland that just wasn't open or available, some due to high touch environments, but I believe mostly due to the fact that Disney was so short staffed with their cast members. Shut down for over 400 days will make a lot of people stay away, go into different areas. It was interesting to see some of this space in front of these two buildings to be used as a once in a lifetime place to sit and have lunch. But nonetheless, very sad to see this part of Frontierland not operational. Not only is the Westward Ho Pin Trading Company open, but as well as the stagecoach that sells pins over to the side of it. The stagecoach, believe it or not, predates the log cabin by about three decades. And like everything else in Frontierland, it originates from Europe. This little stagecoach not only adds some authentic storytelling to Frontierland, but it acts as a mobile kiosk to lure in unfamiliar customers with what's happening around here. Obviously, this was shut down too when we did this back in spring. Inside, we can see the Ponderosa pine and mortar. There are elk and deer antlers placed around the opening area of Frontierland. Elk antlers were commonly placed in general stores in the Old West, so cowboys coming into town immediately knew where to get their supplies from. And we know the rule in Disney retail is to always look up. That is the area where they put the storytelling out of the reach of the customer's hands. And we can see here a lot of items that one would find back in an old Western general store. Lots of perishable goods, cooking supplies, just all the things that cowboys would need. 
and enamel pins. Now, one of my favorite details about the store that most people aren't aware of is that a lot of times the outdoor vendors are really, really busy and slammed. But you can come into the store and you can see down here, they have a small cooler where you can buy ice cold beverages. So if you're trying to think of some place that you want to get a drink, and everybody's backed up trying to sell churros and turkey legs and chimichangas, you can always stop in one of the stores and take advantage of their ice cold beverages. And even though most customers will only ever see it as a simple pin store, with a well-trained eye, you can easily spot all of the design details to tell the story of a late 1800s general store on the edge of town, welcoming all the new settlers that come into this little town. Such a fun little store, full of affordable collectibles. I'm so happy to see it back open. The shooting exposition adds so much life and noise to Frontierland, something I will never take for granted after seeing it used as a picnic patio back in May. The shooting exposition may be the last shooting gallery in Disneyland, but it was far from being the first. I have a video that I did just about the history of that that I'll link below in the description box of this video. I always appreciate the gardens that Disneyland will create to separate the usage of space. The succulent garden with its wooden plank benches and leather strap tree branch fences keeps the area around the shops quiet while the main trail becomes a faster path to Big Thunder Mountain. Each one of these seemingly random gardens is a masterfully designed way to corral humans, the wildest animal of them all, trying to predict their unusual traffic flow while providing masterful storytelling and problem solving like this drain. A plank sidewalk is a lot different than walking the plank. One I do every single time I come to Frontierland, the other I hope to never do. This really does allow you though to walk in the steps of the American Western pioneer by simply walking through town just like they did. In the American Old West, the most popular place to walk to was the establishment in every little town known as the Western Saloon. And notice all the horseshoes are always facing up to catch good luck at the Golden Horseshoe, the saloon of Frontierland. Well, you're welcome to come in and have a good time, but your horse has to get tied up on the old hitching post out front. Here over on the rivers of America, we find Sailing Ship Columbia, a full-scale replica of Columbia Redeviva, the first American ship to ever circumnavigate around the globe, and coincidentally, what space shuttle Columbia was named after, but that's more of a Tomorrowland thing. We definitely did not see the Columbia pulled into the dock when we did this last season, nor did we see this opening day original classic open for business. Originally referred to as Picos Bill's Golden Horseshoe Saloon during construction, the Golden Horseshoe opened in 1955 with 12 other original opening day attractions. Excited for my first walk-in. The interior of the saloon was designed by Harper Golf. Golf was already working on designing exteriors for buildings over on Main Street USA when he was asked to work on this project. Golf even drew up some of the original buildings for Mickey Mouse Park, the failed first attempt at Disneyland next to Walt Disney Studios in Burbank, California. Golf had already designed a saloon for the film Calamity Jane. During Disneyland construction, if you had already halfway done it once, you were now the in-house expert. This is the front of house for the Golden Horseshoe stage. It's amazing to think how many shows have taken place on that stage and how many sound people have sit there to master the sound for all the guests. In fact, if you want to talk about the history of the Golden Horseshoe. Horseshoe unofficially opened on July 13th, 1955, four days before the rest of Disneyland would, when Walt and Lillian Disney, along with dozens of guests, celebrated their 30th wedding anniversary with a private party and the premiere showing of the original Golden Horseshoe Review. And then on the 16th, the day before Disneyland opened to the public, it opened a day early for a private party of corporate sponsors, maybe making this the first ever Club 33. How are you doing, Woody? <laughs> what perfect timing on that. <laughs> That's great. So if you've ever wondered how Woody gets up there, now we've seen the path that he takes to get up there to wave hi to everybody.
<laughs> That's so great. Whereas other lands have skewed heavier to attractions, Frontierland has always been more of a land of leisure, hosting a rich history of restaurants in its past. It's basically the same as like, you know, having your passion. Perfect place to take a phone call. So, um... Frontierland also celebrates California's proud Spanish influence. Soon this area will be used to celebrate some of the fall traditions here in Disneyland. But currently, if you look here, this has been used as an overflow for Big Thunder Mountain whenever needed. Let's walk the back trail of Big Thunder Mountain. This area of Frontierland, I think, was only made stronger by the development of Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. The further and further in you go, the more you get to see how they went through and perfectly manicured this pathway to just create a nice sound barrier and escapism inside of the park. Big Thunder Mountain, if it's done anything perfect, and it's done a lot of things perfect, is the idea that the queue or the line for the attraction is the recess down into the ground. Therefore, we never see hundreds of people waiting to take the wildest ride in the wilderness, and instead, we only see the Bryce Canyon-inspired mountain peak. One of the things I highly recommend you do once you get your magic key is come to Disneyland and explore all of the quiet places. Like here, on this dock inside of Frontierland, as you can see right now, I'm the only guest up here on the platform where you can see the Columbia takeoff and we have the Mark Twain ready to cruise by. Whenever the rope's not closing enough, make sure you come up here and hang out and have an amazing afternoon or early evening. As you walk on the backside of the Big Thunder Trail though, on the edge of Frontierland, there's just so many areas to take a break. I do wish right there there was a water refueling station more of those and less water fountains, especially as we're going into these bizarre health times. But all of the signs, all of the construction, the rock work, it's just a bunch of little small vignettes to put you mentally in this space, but also to create nice sound barriers, visual barriers, so that you feel submerged inside of the frontier, but back on a quieter edge of the park. And there's not many more of these left, making Frontierland truly special. Frontierland may only have one e-ticket attraction, or maybe only one attraction if you consider the Rivers of America to be separate. Nonetheless, Big Thunder Mountain is the gift that keeps on giving. Disneyland has been known to dye their waterways, to hide the mechanisms in these shallow bodies of water. Turtle, oh, oh, turtle, turtle. The green of this little marsh makes it feel very different and separate from the more brown and blue Rivers of America. You know it's hard times and even the waterfalls turned off. <laughs> I've always very much enjoyed the areas of Disneyland that make it feel more like a park, more like getting away versus going to a very busy theme park. The Rainbow Ridge Post Office and all the different little storytelling areas of this back thoroughfare, it really is great escapism, great storytelling, and a great place for a quiet moment when you need to get away from the hustle and bustle that Disneyland can be in 2021. The Big Thunder Trail that is wedged between Frontierland and Star Wars Galaxy's Edge creates some of the best getaway spots where you can recharge your batteries and just kind of get away from all the hustle and bustle of the rest of Disneyland. Truly one of the best escape points in all of the park. Friends, from the edge of Frontierland, that is our summer 2021 designer walkthrough where we walk around each and every land once at a time, exploring everything that has changed since the last season that we've been there. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up, leave a comment below. Did you notice something different that I missed? And do you enjoy Frontierland? Where does it rank for you? Because of Big Thunder Mountain, it's hard to deny that it's one of the most important lands in all of Disneyland. But yet again, it's something that I don't know if it'll be here at the 100th year anniversary. Thank you so much for watching and thank you to my Club 1313 members for making today's video possible. Thank you all. 
friends until the next time I see you getting off the Mark Twain and walking over to the Golden Horseshoe to have a delicious fish and chips. I'll see you back around the channel with more Disneyland designer walkthroughs. I am so pumped that it's open again. Unfortunately, we are cursed by garbage can noises and shadows, but that mural is so great. One of the things I love about Disneyland is how all the lands are put so close together. There's always these magic little moments where it ends from being one land and the next one begins. Here we find ourselves on the edge of where Frontierland gives way to Adventureland. Breaking news, I don't know if you heard, but they found the lizard right there. 